The Churches of Christ presents Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. Hello, I am Alan Ashlock, and I preach for the County Line Church of Christ outside Jonesboro, Arkansas. Thank you for viewing this program. This program is brought to you by the area Churches of Christ who are listed at the end of this program. Please visit or contact them if you have Bible questions. I've been with you this month of November, and this is the last lesson in the series that we'll be doing. And I thank uh, the church at Nettleton for inviting me. I thank the men who are working hard to put this program together that are behind the scenes and their efforts and the, the good work that they do. And I appreciate them very much. And thank you for viewing the program and we hope that it'd be a blessing to you and to everyone. The theme for my month and my time with you has been understanding the Bible. In Psalm 119 verse 34, give me understanding and of course, Psalm 119 is all about the Bible. Every verse is talking in some aspect of the scriptures and the glory of it. It's the longest chapter in all the Bible, Psalm 119. Give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. It is by means of the word of God, the Bible, that we learn so much about God. Our Father, the Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And we learn about the good news of the gospel and the way of salvation that we are to travel. 
We learn about the past, where we've come from, and we learn about why we're here, and we learn about where we're going. And of course, the scriptures tell us that we came from God, and we are here to fear God and keep His commandments, and we are going someplace. That is, even after we die, there is a future. And we want that future to be blessed and wonderful, and it will be if we're in Christ and if we're faithful to Him to the end of our days. We hope that you will be that kind of person, striving by God's grace and goodness to be what you should be in His sight. Now, in our previous lessons, we've looked at the 15 periods of Bible history, and we're going to finish up that series of 15 today. We looked at creation to the flood. That was the first one, there early in Genesis. The flood to the call of Abraham, all the way there to Genesis chapter 12. The patriarchal age, where we have uh, Abraham and the arrival of the children of Israel into Egyptian bondage. Eventually that will happen. Then we have that Egyptian period uh, entering Egypt and then crossing the Red Sea. Uh, the book of Genesis ends with the incredible story of Joseph and God's using him for wonderful things. We have the, uh, the wonderful time of Moses and what he accomplished and the ten plagues that fell upon the Egyptian nation. We have number five, the wandering years of Jordan going all the way crossing the Red Sea to the Jordan. We have the period of conquest, number six, crossing the Jordan to the appointment of the first judge. Then we have number seven, the period of the judges, 15 judges in all. We have there the judge Othniel and also all the way to Samuel, the book of Judges. And we've talked about that in our previous lesson, what we can learn from that. And you can look at the historical books of 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, uh, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, for the historical background books that will help you during this period. Number eight was the United Kingdom all the way to division. King Saul, David, Solomon, 40 years each they would reign. Uh, then you had the number nine, the dual kingdom, the northern kingdom, uh, falls in 722 B.C., and Judah then stands alone. That's number 10 in Bible history. The fall of Samaria to the fall of Jerusalem. About 200 years later after Samaria, Jerusalem falls and is invaded by the Babylonians who take them away into Babylonian captivity. And then the period of captivity. The fall of Jerusalem and then they stay 70 years in the Babylonian world and the Medo-Persian world till finally Cyrus, King Cyrus, will give the order that they can go back. Many of them will not, will not go back. They will stay in those lands and live there, and others will go back. And uh, they'll be led by Ezra, Nehemiah, and others. Uh, different trips, different numbers of people will return, build back the walls of Jerusalem that were destroyed, build back the temple, and reset everything as much as they can. Think about a nation being destroyed, literally completely destroyed, and then Years later, people going back trying to rebuild it. What a task that would be in any age or time period. That period of captivity, fall of Jerusalem to the decree of Cyrus. We must mention the book of Esther. Uh, great women are all through the Bible. And Esther is one of the great women of the Bible who becomes queen of uh, that Medo-Persian world. And she uh, does some amazing things. The book of Esther does not mention God's name. But God's providence is all through the book. And she is told by Mordecai that uh, who is to know that you were not born for such a time as this? That's a thoughtful th statement for each of us in every generation. We were born for this time. We live only a short time. Do what you can with what you have for the time given to you to make a better world to the glory of Almighty God. Beginning with yourself and your family, Try to do that which is good. And so Esther saves her nation. One woman, by her courage and leadership, will be able to influence the king and save the nation from what was going to be genocide. Uh, Hitler was not the first to try to commit complete genocide against the Jewish people. And uh, perhaps he'll not be the last, sad to say, as we think about evil in this world. And then there was the period of the Restoration. Uh, Cyrus' decree uh, to the end of Nehemiah's work. And that brings us to our last four for this day. Number 12, the restoration period. They're going back home. The Cyrus gives his decree. Ezra and Nehemiah will go back. Let us build back the walls. Let us build back the temple. 
That's a great plea that has been seen in other generations where we see that faith even in Christ has been corrupted and a new generation comes and says, let us go back to the Bible and let us stand for what the Bible really says. And let's not add to it and let's not take away. Let's try to be loyal servants of Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a plea for every age. We have what we call the restoration movement more in uh, modern times, the 19th century, uh, even into the 20th century, this plea uh, of trying to be just what God wants us to be. You might remember during the Reformation period, men like Martin Luther crying out for reform against the Roman church. Uh, he has 90 plus different uh, complaints against that church, nailing it to the Pope's door, so history says, or some have said about it. Uh, and he lived most of his life under a death threat because of his courage to speak out against what he thought was corruption, what he saw as corruption in his day, and wanted people to respect the scriptures. And that's something that's a good plea in every age, be what the Bible teaches us to be. Ezra and Nehemiah were bold, bold individuals and leaders. They uh, wanted the people to work hard, to give their best, at one time it says they had a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other because others in the area were trying to attack them as they were trying to rebuild the walls. And uh, what an amazing time that was. But if you have a mind to work, it said they succeeded because they had a mind to work. And that's a good challenge for a church in any place. Do you have a mind or determination to work to accomplish the great work of God? God wants us to be faithful servants. At the end of number 12 here, the restoration period of Cyrus and his decree to the end of Nehemiah's work, we have the end of the Old Testament. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. The last one is Malachi. I mentioned this briefly before. Some of the prophets were uh, writing prophets. We have those right here in those 39 books. Uh, and there were other prophets that were non-writing prophets like Elijah and Elisha. These were men that did not write, but they were powerful prophets in and of themselves in the day in which they, they live. Much like uh, John the Baptist will not write a book, but he was a truly a great servant and prophet of Almighty God. We get to Malachi and, and each of these books are telling us as you go through the prophets to repent, tell the nations to repent, get back to God. And they also hold out hope of the coming Messiah. Isaiah, for example, is one of the prophets that is noted for his great promises about the coming Messiah. Isaiah 53 is the great Messianic chapter. If you're reading scripture before the Lord's Supper, that would be a great one to read on a regular basis. Isaiah 53 of the suffering Messiah to get our minds ready for the Lord's Supper and thinking about what we should be thinking about. Well, Malachi ends that, that period of time as, as we have it arranged uh, in our Bibles. Uh, the 39th book is Malachi. Then we have a period of time in which we call it the intertestamental period. Uh, it's about 400 years. After Malachi passes from the scene to the time John the Baptist will start preaching, 400 years will pass. Uh, some call this the period of silence. I'm not so sure that's a, a really a proper statement to make about it. Uh, is God ever silent? I think God works always, perhaps in ways we don't know anything about. All things work together for good to them that love God are called according to his purpose. God is like in the book of Esther. God's name's not mentioned, but he was certainly working all there in the lives of everyone to save that nation. So it is that this intertestamental period, the end of Nehemiah's work to John the Baptist, some big things happen between the Old Testament and the first of the New Testament, big things. Alexander the Great comes on the scene, takes over much of the known world of that time. It'll be followed by the Roman world. And when you open up Matthew, you're gonna find in the New Testament, three Roman Caesars are mentioned. Uh, and the first one, of course, is Augustus, who is the one that uh, gave the order for the census, causing Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem to be registered. And that's where Jesus would be born. Uh, you have, uh, the Greek world that paved the way with a common language, a communication tool that would go all over that world. People could speak Greek and they would write in Greek and all of that. Every nation would have people who were most familiar with that language, a common Koine Greek language. And so that helped in the preaching of the gospel later. Paul would be speaking uh, in that Greek language and write um, uh, his books in the Greek. 
Uh, you had transportation that was improved, great Roman roads and everything, and security that was provided so that people could travel safely by and large uh, to the various places of the world, enabling Paul and others to travel and preach the gospel to so many people. So you have that intertestamental period, and finally it will end when John the Baptist comes on the scene. He'll break that silence, if you want to call it silence, or there was no prophet that we know of during that time. And uh, he would say, the time is at hand. The time is at hand. And so he will make introduction to Jesus Christ. He, he will tell his disciples, look over there. It was Jesus walking by. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so John the Baptist was a great, great preacher of God's word. He urged even kings to repent of their great wickedness and to bow before Almighty God. It was an interesting period, to say the least. John the Baptist will be faithful to end, and he will be killed because he spoke the truth of Almighty God. May God help us all to stand by God's word, even if we are persecuted, even like John the Baptist. And then we have John the Baptist period that I would go all the way to Acts 2, and I would call this a period of time of Jesus. He's born in Bethlehem of Judea. He will die outside the walls of Jerusalem. He will live about 33 years on this earth. He will do mighty miracles and wonders, confirming who he was, the Son of God, more than a mere man. His preaching was absolutely amazing. As the Bible says at the end of Matthew 7 on the Sermon on the Mount, they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. His preaching was profound, it was rich, it was enduring. And the Sermon on the Mount, for example, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, a masterpiece of godly living and walking with God. The great Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, he loved people, he cared about people. He healed them. He walked on water, showing power over disease, power over nature. He cast out demons, showing power over the spiritual world. He raised the dead, like with the case of Lazarus, been dead four days. And he himself would be resurrected, showing power over death itself. People didn't understand always why he would die like he did. The prophets told that it would happen. Isaiah 53, 800 years earlier, said this is how it will happen. People should have Listen to the scriptures. They would have seen the signs. Wouldn't it not be sad to think of living in that day and time and you had studied scriptures all your life and Jesus comes on the scene and you don't recognize him? You don't uh, have enough understanding of scripture to see there he is, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But even today, people sometimes are so confused and so mixed up with so many things in this life. Remember earlier I talked about how sin clouds our mind, our judgment, so we cannot see. We let things of the world push out Jesus so that we only see what we want to see rather than what we should see. So we ourselves, if we lived during that time, we might have been just like they were and not seen because we were so consumed with other things. Jesus comes on the scene, born of a virgin, lives his life faithfully, dedication. One of the greatest things about that time period, if, been, if you had lived, would have been to meet Jesus. And can you think about just sitting at his feet, listening to him talk in his words and his power. I think of the road to Emmaus after he was resurrected. The disciples didn't recognize him at first, and it was Jesus resurrected from the dead. And uh, they didn't recognize him, and they take him home, and he sits at the table with them, eats with them, and then just literally vanishes from their sight. They later said about it, Did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke unto us and opened up the scriptures? Ah, to have Jesus tell you what all the scriptures mean. I think it's worth our time to really spend time with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Think about Jesus. Really study those books. They can become a light to help us understand the rest of the Bible. You see, Jesus talked about scriptures. He was talking about the Old Testament scriptures of his time, but he gave us an example and an understanding of how to look at scriptures and how to see it. And he got on to the Pharisees and the scribes of that day for abusing the scriptures and teaching things that were not correct and also making it more difficult for people. He opened up the scriptures. 
and show the truth that people needed to live by. Well, we have that period of time, the intertestamental period, then the time of Christ and His glory. He'll be taken by cruel hands, and He'll be crucified. He'll die a horrible death on that cross. You might look and study in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the seven miracles of the cross, and also the seven last statements of Jesus. They are fascinating to study and to look at. We don't have time to go into all those, but I hope you'll look that up and you'll find it to be very helpful and meaningful to you. After Jesus died, he was resurrected. He was here 40 days. Paul later says that uh, Jesus appeared to an audience of over 500 people who saw him alive after the resurrection. And years later, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15 and referred to that, he said that many of them were still alive, eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he gave that powerful chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, about the resurrection and how important it is. And that about the upcoming resurrection of all of us and the new body that we shall receive and all of that. Wonderful things to that chapter. We call it the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. And then 10 days after he ascends back to the Father, as taught in Acts chapter 1. Then we have the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles. They receive the Spirit and begin to preach. People gather around there in Jerusalem. Evidently, it was thousands that ended up being there in that assembly listening. We have Peter's sermon, and he exalts Jesus Christ. He tells them, some of you, by cruel hands, took the Son of God and crucified Him. And when they heard all of this and the arguments that he made for the fulfillment of the great work of Jesus, they interrupted his sermon more or less and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Read a few verses down. Some 3,000 did just that. Read on down, Acts 2.47, and God added them to the church, the saved body, the church. The church became a living reality there in Acts chapter 2. And that was uh, 10 days after the ascension of Christ, the day of Pentecost. And Jesus resurrected back there after the Passover on the three days and three nights in the grave. And on the first day, resurrected. He was here 40 days. And then 10 more days was the day of Pentecost. And uh, the church was established, a living reality. The church will continue to grow. They will continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. There will be great evangelistic work. Uh, Peter will be involved, all the apostles. We have some traditional historical records where all the apostles were scattered and went all different places preaching the gospel. And Paul is the most famous, perhaps, with his three great missionary journeys into the world of his day, uh, going all the way to Rome. He talked about in Romans, I want to go to Spain after I'm in Rome, and I want to preach there. Evidently, he'd had some correspondence there. There's some uh, traditional writings that talk about how that when he was in Spain, uh, he was uh, invited to come to Britannia, which is Great Britain, and preach even there. And then returned back to Rome, was arrested during that time of Nero, and was executed as a Christian because he was faithful to Jesus. Well, the book of Acts is a powerful, powerful book telling you what men did to be saved. Also, it's a book someone mentioned to me years ago of non-conversion, of those who did not obey the gospel. And why did they not obey? That's an interesting study as well. And then we have from Acts 2 onward, and I would call it the church age, all the way to the close of Revelation. Now you have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the who of the gospel. And the who of the gospel is Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, you have the what of the gospel. And the what is, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 30, 31. The question is asked in the book of Acts, and it's answered how I should be saved, what I should do in response to the grace, mercy, and love of God through Jesus who died on the cross. And then I have the book of Romans through Revelation. And they are books that ask and answer, how should I live the Christian life? And they tell me to live a spiritual life. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11, add to your faith 
virtue and knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Uh, a spiritual life. And then the New Testament letters tell me to live a moral life. First Corinthians uh, it's a great book on morality uh, and ethics and living a, a moral life before God and to avoid the immoral things of the world. Galatians 5, 19, 20, 21, avoid those things of the flesh and live by the Spirit, verse 22 and following. And then I should live a life of service to God, like Jesus uh, washing the disciples' feet. Uh, he, Jesus taught us, the greatest is he that serves, willing to serve in the kingdom. And so I should live a life of service. And then I finally should live a life of submission unto the Heavenly Father. Do His will the best I can with what I have for the time that's given to me and finally go home with Him. Revelation is the last book. It's that capstone of the Bible. Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful even unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. It closes about A.D. 96, but that's not the end of the story. The story will go on to the second century, the third century, the fourth century, all the way to the 20th century, and now the 21st century. And here we are by means of television talking about Jesus like those of old did so long ago. Love Jesus. Believe in Him. Trust Him. Give your life to Him. Obey the gospel. Be faithful. Churches of Christ are here willing to help you in every way they can to be right with God and to one day have heaven as your home. The church is God's family. We help each other. We strive to help you. God bless you now, and God bless you always. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online at nettletonchurchofchrist.org.